Hi, I'm Father Chris Adlar of the Marian Fathers here at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy, and welcome back to Living Divine Mercy here on EWTN. This is an exciting week because we are now in the Easter octave and preparing this Sunday for Divine Mercy Sunday. What Jesus told St. Faustina was mankind's last hope of salvation. And so with this, we're going to tell you a little bit more about Divine Mercy and what Divine Mercy Sunday Graces are all about. In fact, we'll hear about God making us an offer that we can't refuse. So let's now turn to Father Mark Barron, the Father Joseph of the Association of Marian Helpers. We are One of the things that I think we all have in common is that we all love, to some degree, music and movies. I think it is fair to say that the songs we listen to and the movies we like to see help to define the people that we are. Oftentimes, our love for music and movies becomes part of the conversation we have with family, friends, or colleagues at work. At times, we even like to randomly repeat lyrics from songs or quote famous phrases or lines from movies. You know, this Sunday, we celebrate Divine Mercy Sunday. And if I were to choose one famous quote from a movie to help us understand what Divine Mercy Sunday is about, and I know there are a lot of possibilities out there, but if I were to choose just one to help us grasp how important this day is, it would be this one. I'm gonna make him an offer he can't refuse. I'm gonna make him an offer he can't refuse. Okay. <laughs> now, some of you, if not many of you, may be wondering why I would pick a quote from a mafia movie to summarize the feast day of Divine Mercy Sunday. Surely there are better quotes out there to reference, aren't there? Well, let me explain why I think this is the best choice. First, let's recall the origins of Divine Mercy Sunday and what this day is essentially about. Divine Mercy Sunday is part of the octave of Easter. We remember that the octave of Easter refers to the fact that Easter is so great a mystery that the church takes eight days to celebrate it. The church therefore celebrates the Easter solemnity for eight consecutive days, beginning on Easter Sunday through the following Sunday. Of all the days in the octave of Easter, however, there is only one that has been made a special feast. That is the last day. And this was done back in the year 2000 when Pope St. John Paul II declared that the second Sunday of Easter, which again is the eighth and last day of the Easter octave, should be called Divine Mercy Sunday. His inspiration to do this primarily came from the private revelations given by Jesus to Sister Faustina. We find in St. Faustina's diary, where these private revelations are recorded, that Jesus requested 14 times that such a feast be celebrated on the Sunday after Easter. Jesus was so insistent about this because he wanted a feast where his mercy would be worshipped, and worshipped in such a way that the feast day itself could be a refuge and shelter for all souls, especially poor sinners. Why was this feast day necessary? The primary reason is that Jesus desires to save us, not condemn us. That is why he came to earth, and that is why he died on the cross for us. However, he needs us to respond and cooperate with the graces that he has won for us. And the main obstacle that keeps people from surrendering to the Lord and his mercy is a lack of trust. In our weaknesses, we can believe lies about God, that he erodes our ability to trust that he is good and that he really cares about us. And this is why Jesus wanted a feast day established where his mercy could be the object of worship not because he needs it for himself, like some egomaniac, but because we need it. 
We need to know how much God cares for us and how badly he wants to help us overcome sin in our life so he can draw us close to his heart. All of this helps us to understand that the proper aim of the Feast of Divine Mercy Sunday, then, is to view the Easter mystery, that is, the entire work of redemption from the perspective of divine mercy, so that we can comprehend the work of Jesus' passion, death, and resurrection, and the graces that he merited for our salvation as the greatest manifestation of God's mercy towards us. Appreciating the infinite mercy of God in this way is meant then to inspire us to approach God to receive his mercy in our life in spite of our sinfulness, to trust in God's mercy, and be more conscientious in showing mercy to our neighbor. It is through these acts that we essentially accomplish the worship of his mercy that Jesus desires especially on Divine Mercy Sunday. But that is not all. To help convince us even more how good and merciful he is towards us so as to make Divine Mercy Sunday truly an effective refuge for all mankind, especially for sinners, Jesus told St. Faustina that on Divine Mercy Sunday, all the divine floodgates through which graces flow are open and that he wants to pour out a whole ocean of graces upon those souls who approach the fountain of mercy on that day. Then to really show us how generous his merciful heart is, he makes us a promise, or should we say, an offer. St. Faustina recorded in her diary three times that Jesus promises that on Divine Mercy Sunday, the soul that will go to confession and receive Holy Communion shall obtain complete forgiveness of sins and punishment due to sin. This exceptional grace is similar to the grace you receive in the sacrament of baptism, where all personal sins and punishment due to sins are also wiped away. The significance of this grace can be better understood if we realize that nothing unclean or impure can enter into heaven. That means to go straight to heaven when you die, you first have to die in a state of grace, which means not dying in a state of mortal sin. And then, if you do die in a state of grace, then you need to have atoned for all the temporal punishment due to sin, which is pretty hard to do. If we have not made satisfaction for all of our sins then, we will need to make a stop in purgatory. So Jesus offering us this grace can be equated to a second baptism where we can get a clean slate seems almost too good to be true, especially when you consider that all we have to do on Mercy Sunday is receive our Lord worthily, which means in a state of grace and not in a state of mortal sin, and then after receiving him, make the intention of honoring God's unfathomable mercy by acknowledging the truth of it, surrendering to our need for it, and trusting that Jesus will keep the promise he made to us. But it is not. The reality is that Jesus, to show how good and generous he is, is just making us an offer we really can't refuse. You know, in The Godfather, there are three different instances in which a character repeats the line about the offer one can't refuse. Each time someone has made an offer he couldn't refuse, the person literally couldn't refuse it, or else they would kill him. So basically, the offer wasn't so much an offer as it was a command, and if you refuse it, you die. The great promise that Jesus makes us on Divine Mercy Sunday, however, truly is an offer because God, as we know, respects our free will. And we can refuse what he's offering us, either in the great promise of a second baptism or in any of the graces that he is making available to us on that day, and not have to worry about being killed. However, we have to be careful. God has made us to live for eternity. And it is only by having recourse to his mercy that we can be saved. Jesus reminds us in the diary that our last hope of salvation is having recourse to his mercy. He says, if we will not adore his mercy, then we will perish for all eternity. So this Mercy Sunday, 
let's take advantage of not what the Godfather is offering to us, but what God the Father is offering to us through the merits of His Son. Take advantage of what is being made available to us. God the Father is calling saints and big sinners to take part in this feast of mercy. Don't refuse his offer. Father Chris, back to you. Well, thank you again, Father Mark, for the enlightening explanation of Divine Mercy Sunday. And so we would just like, as Marian fathers, to remind you once again about this incredible day. What does Jesus ask from us, and what is the promise that we call the extraordinary promise? Okay, in a nutshell, Jesus asks through St. Faustina for us to go to confession. Now, we could do that anytime from today through Divine Mercy Sunday, as long as we are in a state of grace, and then to receive Holy Communion on Divine Mercy Sunday. Now, that could be at the vigil on Saturday, the night before, or any Mass on Divine Mercy Sunday, even if the priest is not talking about mercy, which he should, and even if the Mass is not at 3 o'clock. Again, as long as you've been to confession and receive Holy Communion. Now, this includes some rectification of the will. We must have purpose of amendment to leave sin behind and change our lives. And if we do all this, which really isn't that hard, Jesus makes the incredible, what we call extraordinary promise, to remit all sin that we have committed, that's through confession, but also all the temporal punishment that we are due for our sins, which may normally may not be relieved in the confessional. So what an incredible opportunity. So after you've been to confession and receive Holy Communion on Divine Mercy Sunday, just basically ask God, basically telling him, Lord, you promised St. Faustina that the soul that's been to confession I have and the soul who receives Holy Communion I just did will receive complete forgiveness of sin and punishment. So hold the Lord to his promise and say, Lord, I've done this. Please give me this grace. Forgive my sin and punishment. And he will, or Jesus is a liar. And nobody is going to claim that. So what a beautiful opportunity that you don't want to miss. As Father Mark said, God's making you an offer you can't refuse. Now, many theologians tell us that we also have to do an act of mercy on Divine Mercy Sunday, but we should be doing that every day. Now, here's an inspirational story of a group in Colorado involving praying the rosary that does just that, praying for others as an act of mercy. We are created to be in community, uh, that it is not good (laughs) for us to be alone, as, as God said from the very beginning. We're able to bring the light of Christ to them. They don't necessarily have anyone else encouraging them. It's connection with each other, and then they get to connect with God, who gives us all life. The Rosary Team is a prayer apostolate, bringing the love of Jesus and devotion to our Blessed Mother into nearly 120 care communities and skilled nursing facilities in six states across the country. Prayer is important because it's our connection to the Lord. It's our connection to God. It's that privileged place that we have to meet God, um, to bring Him our needs and the needs of others. And it's absolutely essential to the Christian life. We're always glad to have you. Yeah, always. These small pairings of prayer warriors offer their time weekly to visit people who are in need of prayer. It's always good to see you on Tuesdays. This is one of my favorite times of the week is to come hang out with you guys. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. They lead the rosary for them. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death, amen. They pray for peace. I believe in God, the Father, the Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And healing in their own lives and for the world. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. They have the ability to pray for all of us. They have the ability to pray for the world. Our world is in a desperate place right now, and we need their prayers. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. 
Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Right now with the rosary team, we estimate we're praying 45,000 rosaries a year to offer up to God for peace in our world and for salvation of souls. Holy, Holy Mary, Mary, Mother, Mother of God, God, pray for us sinners now, now and at the hour, hour of our death. death. Amen. The residents love praying the rosary with the volunteers. It is a very special time that they have together. They know that that time is spent growing closer to God and it brings hope and joy contemplating God and heaven and what that will be like for them someday. Praying the rosary brings them that hope in eternal life. You don't have to pray the rosary for long to realize that its power to transform people is undeniable. A lot of our residents aren't Catholic and then many of them are, but the big question I always say to them is, well, do you believe in the power of prayer? And they always say yes. And so that just, I think, in and of itself, weaves a connective um, tapestry between um, different people. Holy Mary, Mother, Mother of God, God pray, pray for, for us sinners. sinners. It's a powerful tool of intercession where Mary is just encouraging us to put our confidence in her and through her in her son. And so we need the rosary to be able to grow in that confidence. Stephanie Joe McCulture. Yeah, it's a beautiful name. Yeah. <laughs> the time and prayer the rosary team share with people opens the door for deeper connection. Sharing joys, sorrows, and developing relationships is what makes this experience so rich. There is a great need to be able to connect with others, to be able to connect with friends, to be able to connect with family. <laughs> I see they gave you some water. Did you get some good orange juice? I see the rosary teams fulfilling an amazing need in such a easy, natural way of coming to uh, their brothers and sisters and sharing time and sharing prayer, um, sharing conversation, uh, sharing their lives. And, and you can see the difference that it makes people's day to, to just have someone come to visit um, that they can share some time with. For me, it's important that they can share their story. Just knowing that there's that joy um, that can be brought from that conversation, that story, uh, I think helps people just feel, feel like they belong, feel like they are still a part of this world, um, still a part of their community, and they're still seen as important. It's a little taste of heaven on earth because we know we're meant to be one with each other and one in God. And we get to do that every week. And today is Monday, so we're gonna pray the joyful mysteries. The need is great for companionship, for people to walk with, and for people to have encouragement in their faith life, which is the ultimate communion that we all need and desire above everything else. Just as scripture tells us, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. The rosary team is made up of volunteers, so the success of this mission of prayer depends on God's people saying yes to the call of leading prayer where it is needed the most. The volunteers are amazing, and they're amazing because they said yes. They said yes to God asking them to fulfill this mission. I just see a lot of hope I see a lot of miracles, and I just see a lot of empathy from people who are in difficult situations themselves. And that's, I think, truly God's work right there. They're all offering a spiritual work of mercy. They're offering a spiritual work through their prayers, and we see over and over again, and we hear over and over again from our mother that she desperately desires us to pray. And that's what our world needs the most right now. Together, they're offering a work of mercy for the world. Well, thank you to the Rosary team. It's great to hear that you're spreading to many other states.
Now let's hear novice Austin as he reads from the Psalms of the Bible about God's merciful love. I will sing of your mercies, O Lord, forever. With my mouth I will proclaim your faithfulness to all generations. For your merciful love was established forever. Your faithfulness is firm as the heavens. You have said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David my servant. I will establish your descendants forever and build your throne for all generations. Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? Who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord? A God feared in the council of the holy ones, great and awesome above all that are round about him. O Lord God of hosts, who is mighty as you are, O Lord, with your faithfulness round about you? You rule the raging of the seas. When its waves rise, you still them. You crushed Rahab like a carcass. You scattered your enemies with your mighty arm. The heavens are yours, the earth also is yours. The world and all that is in it, you have founded them. One of St. Therese of Lisieux's favorite verses of scripture was Psalm 89, verse 1. I will sing of your mercies, O Lord, forever. The Hebrew word here for mercies is chesed. God's chesed is his dependable, merciful love for us, the kind of love that we can always count on. For St. Therese, this verse summarizes her whole life. She writes about it on the first page of her autobiography, which her mother superior asked her to write. Therese tells her, The day you asked me to do this, it seemed to me it would distract my heart by too much concentration on myself. But since then, Jesus has made me feel that in obeying simply, I would be pleasing to him. Besides, I am going to be doing only one thing. I shall begin to sing what I must sing eternally, the mercies of the Lord. We too can sing the mercies of the Lord every day, witnessing to his love by our prayer, our loving service of others, and our complete trust in his mercy. In that way, like St. Therese, we will be getting a head start on what we will be doing with boundless joy throughout eternity. Now let's hear from Donna Ross, who, through her prayer group, found God's inspiring mercy to help her get through difficult times. When Donna Ross joined a small but growing prayer group, she had no idea it would be a life-changing experience. So it's almost a 40-year-old prayer group, which is amazing. So as it turns out, this prayer group, uh, we just kept getting more and more introduced to our church that we grew up with. We started praying and became more familiar with this divine mercy. And the next thing we know, this little prayer group from nowhere of source feels led to host for our diocese uh, a Divine Mercy Sunday. So uh, we did. And uh, so for about a half a dozen years, we uh, sponsored with the help of um, a number of religious communities like the Sisters from Alhambra, the Carmelites and such. And then the Holy Mother Church decided to make, as you know, uh, Divine Mercy an official feast on the liturgical calendar. Then a test of faith, Donna's husband was diagnosed with throat cancer. After several surgeries, Donna began the hard work of caregiver. Meanwhile, that little prayer group looked toward Poland and a pilgrimage for the first official liturgical celebration of the feast. Donna couldn't imagine leaving her husband to join them, but put her trust in God's will. And he pulled through the week before I got on that plane. My husband, for the very first time, could feed himself through the feeding tube. All I can say is God must flood us with the grace we need at the moment we need it. I go to Poland and we participate in the Divine Mercy Sunday there. They have the outdoor mass on the Feast of the Divine Mercy. It is pouring buckets, right? We are bundled up to the nth degree. We all have our umbrellas. The rain is coming in on us. We were so soaked that I don't think we could even feel, you know, we were so numb. And I 
have to say, I asked the Lord on many occasions while I was there, why am I here again? And he would say to me, I have called you to be uncomfortable for me. He didn't call us to be comfortable in our walk with him. He calls us to be uncomfortable and to trust him and to allow him to be the ruler of our life, the God in our life, the, to understand our relationship with him. Well, thank you, everybody. And please remember to be with us here on EWTN Sunday afternoon as we come live from the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy for the celebration of Divine Mercy Sunday. Now, we got a great day planned for you starting at noon on the East Coast or 9 a.m. on the West Coast. We'll begin with great guests such as Archbishop Brolio and Father Don Calloway, but we'll also have because the show's topic will be spiritual fatherhood and its importance. We'll also have former NFL quarterback Elvis Gerback. We'll have one of the coaches from the Arizona Cardinals named Ben Steele. And we'll also have Jim Wahlberg, who we all know and love. Again, a special day to get the spiritual fathers to tune in and see how to get God's grace and mercy. So also join us next week because, you know, we married fathers were entrusted with the message and devotion ocean of divine mercy. And so next week, we're going to be talking about our founder, St. Stanislaus Papchinski, the Padre Pio of Poland. He's the one who brought us divine mercy. So until then, may Almighty God bless you, the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.